At that point, the border guards just basically let everybody in. And thus, the second largest city in Jordan was founded for a period of time. We all know that camp as the Zatay camp. There were volunteers on that line. A close friend of mine was there. And they had brought in people to help them out. And he described to me that one time during the, the dinner line, and the lady, one of his closest friends, just put down her plate, stepped back from the line, and started screaming. She started screaming. She continued to scream. People are trying to ask her what's wrong. People are trying to settle her down. She screamed. She keeps screaming and walks out of the camp screaming. She never comes back to the camp. She just walked out of the main line, started walking through the camp screaming hysterically. She refused to talk to us. We never heard from her again. And that person was actually the volunteer psychiatrist who couldn't take it anymore. The person you're bringing to help you out with the horrors had seen so much horror, too fast, too much, she couldn't handle it. Who watches the watchman? The trauma of relief work is the most understudied aspect of the relief effort. Because we always look at the victim. We don't look at the volunteers that are trying to help them out. And more tragically, we forget, as the examples are in Somalia, in Syria, southern Sudan, and Yemen, that very often the victims are the relief workers themselves. They're double victimized. They're victims of the atrocities going on in their home countries. Everybody leaves. Global politics is what it is. And so they stay and volunteer only to be abused again. The year, of 19, the year in 1998 was the year more United Nations aid workers were killed than peacekeeping soldiers. In 1997, the rate of attacks was four per 10,000 exposures. So therefore, four attacks for every 10,000 volunteer exposures with aid. By 2015, the number of attacks increased almost, almost 400%, 350%, as a rate of 14 per 10,000 exposures. Therefore, we know that at the very least in 2000 study, we know that there were 375 known deaths. And the number is in the thousands now. Because global conflicts around the world have increased dramatically. Statistics for injury to aid workers in Syria is even more startling. The five most common types of trauma, frightening situations. There's almost no one who's in Syria who doesn't experience a frightening situation. It's almost a standard part of now becoming a Syrian. Any one of you and many of you have worked with Syrian refugees. And there's no myth to the horrors they've seen. No difference than, for instance, in the Somali population, or in the Sudanese population, and now tragically in the Yemeni population. A frightening situation is now part of life. Threats of being chased, greater than 47%. Because you're never only threatened because you're being chased by the enemy, whoever that enemy may be. You may be threatened by the very people you're helping because they feel you're not helping enough. Forced separation from family, over 60% experience that. Whether they're volunteers coming from across the ocean to help out in, another, in, in Syria, or for the Syrians themselves, very often voluntarily forcing their separation to keep their families safe, because kidnapping is a very common tool of terrorism. Because the best way is that you threaten the aid worker and the relief worker that if you do one more thing that we don't like, we're not going to kill you, we're not going to hurt you, we're going to hurt your family. Shelling, bombing of office, greater than 70% have experienced that. Hostility of the local population, greater than 45%. One minute you can be the hero, and the next minute you can be the enemy. One minute they're happy that you delivered aid, and the next minute they're unhappy you delivered aid. The politics of it is dramatic. Why? Because if there's a powerful enough individual on the other side to argue that the aid you're bringing in is competing against his clan or her clan's ability to make money, now suddenly you're the enemy. 
Other traumas including the murder of a colleague, sexual assault and rape, which is all too common, both to men and to women, boys and to girls who are volunteers and aid workers, but tragically underreported, and imprisonment, which traumatizes all parties involved. This is from the uh, war, uh, warsintheworld.com map, but the data here, the deadliest conflicts for aid workers currently in the world, Southern Sudan, Syria, Afghanistan. That's from January 2019. Now, by the way, that doesn't, that, we're talking about the worst, right? The worst conflicts right now. But Yemen, Somalia, the United, uh, the uh, Congo, are rapidly getting close. The Rohingya tragedy, rapidly close. 67 countries around the world are currently engaged in military conflict with 780 guerrilla groups engaged in those conflicts. You can only imagine then the thousands of people exposed from people who are professional aid workers and professional aid organizations to the volunteer aid workers that are locally just trying to save their local community, their local identity, their local history. This is what I saw as a relief worker. A shelled out tank just outside of our hospital. This was a relief hospital I worked at before it was blown apart. This was from a, uh, a rocket from one of the Syrian regime forces. This was a gentleman who was protecting children who were just outside playing in a soccer field when a barrel bomb exploded and the shards went into the back of his skull. And this was from an individual who was actually trying to protect other workers, other aid workers, who unfortunately fell as a consequence and was killed as a consequence of trying to help the aid people out. That's what I saw. You hold on to these images to keep the horrors of what you see away. Because I can tell you it was very difficult. I had nightmares every night of waking up, being arrested, being captured, being kidnapped, being tortured and being maimed. You try to hold on to these images, this gentleman was actually one of the people that helped us out driving us around, and he had to escape one night. One night we couldn't find him. He had to leave, he had to disappear. Because they threatened him and his entire family that if he didn't leave, they were going to kill everybody he knew. You hold on the images of your child as you play with them looking at flamingos, far away from the horrors of what you're seeing every day. And I'm the lucky one, because I get on a plane and come back to the United States and get these images. The tragedy of relief workers is that they're seen as volunteers. You volunteered for this. You chose to be in this situation. Very often, it's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of human obligation. It's a matter of being a good neighbor. It's a matter of fulfilling a need an uh, to make us whole as a community again, as, 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 part, as members, as global citizens. The other problem is the challenge of the definition. You can't get good data on relief workers because relief workers have multiple names. Are they aid workers? Are they humanitarian workers? Are they disaster relief agents? Are they relief workers? So the data, the data is very difficult. So the data coming out of Syria is always very difficult for us to know. What happens to those volunteers? I had a picture here of a hospital that I worked at where they were, it was just too difficult to post because 13, there's me and 13 other doctors, nine of whom are dead. If you talk as a straw poll of relief mission coordinators who go into Syria, mainly like the Syrian American Medical Society, Atlantic Humanitarian Relief, and USA, and talking to them. So this is a straw poll, okay? I'm, I, I, you know, I'm doing my best to gather data in the limited capacity as a non-statistician uh, that I am. 20% of volunteers are never heard from again. There's a reason for that. 20% are supportive. Hey, look, I'll give you money, but please don't ask me to go. I'll never go again. 20% will help, but only from the United States. Don't get me near any orders. Don't get me near any politics. Don't put me in any pictures. Don't put me in any journals. Don't mention my name. 20% continue to help part-time, and only 20% continue to help full-time. Again, I don't mean full-time like 40 hours a week. 
I mean, they're available when a mission trip comes about and we need you. So you can see that the, the energy, the excitement of helping out in this trip crisis, when you see the humanitarian need, translates very quickly and dissipates very quickly once the horrors of a conflict are experienced. The number of aid workers seeking mental health assistance after visiting Syria is unknown. But I can tell you, desperately needed. So let's compare the mental health of, of the, the trauma relief work in Syria. This is from Ras, uh, Dr. Ras Abdel from, uh, from Yusuf in Turkey. Okay, so very startling numbers. So let's look at study by Turkey's Islahi camp, which looked at refugee children. 44% reported symptoms of depression. Dr. Ross noted, aid workers in Syria experienced major depression exceeding general population. 45% showed sign of post-traumatic stress disorder, 10 times the prevalence amongst children worldwide. This is trauma of pediatric refugees from Syria. Okay? Let's look at the relief workers. PTSD is five to 10 times the rate of general population. U.S. 45% uh, shows, I'm sorry, U.S. communities that are preparing to receive Syrian refugees should establish connections with pediatric mental health providers and other community resources for children who have suffered traumatic events. That's the recommendation for this, from the CDC as pediatric refugees come in from Syria into the United States. Where does the aid worker go? What agency receives the aid worker? What process do we decompress? Even the US military has a decompression period. We know people with extreme hostage situations. What do they do? They don't put the person that was a hostage immediately back with their family. The people that were captured in Colombia for a year or two, what happened? They put them in a very specialized place to slowly reorient them back to normal life. The aid worker very often doesn't get that reception. Why? Because you were a volunteer. You chose to put yourself in this situation. But we have to change that attitude. That heroism shouldn't be a price you have to pay for mental illness and mental suffering. Substance abuse and suicide are difficult measures due to cultural factors, but they're very common amongst aid workers from Syria. It's very common to watch a friend of mine who, a devout Muslim, just start drinking alcohol to forget. He may still, or she may still pray fast and do all the things, but they need something to forget. Because the shame of going to a doctor, the Amrad the Nafsiyye, right, is greater than the shame of drinking alcohol. I'm not trying to put a religious connotation or anything on anybody, okay? But the idea here is you can see that you start making what they call relative valuation. The incidence of suicide by cop is extremely common where people actually allow themselves to get injured, blown up, killed, because there's no other option. There were people we knew we were going to be shelled, we were going to be killed, we were going to be destroyed if we don't get out of there. They refuse to leave. They'll tell you that I need to help the people that are coming in. But you don't know what's coming in, because we're evacuating their area. They want to be killed. They need to find a way to kill themselves without the cultural shame of committing suicide. Major majority of relief workers experience some degree of sleep disturbance, anxiety, persistent coping imbalances. The mental trauma relief work, the resources are limited as relief organizations concentrate on the care of the victimized patient, the population, forgetting that the victimized population very often is the source of your relief workers. Unrealistic expectations of the coping ability of relief workers, right? You should feel good, you help somebody out. Why do we say that? But we all know how many doctors and mental health workers and de dentists end up committing suicide or suffer from mental because they're the ones that are supposed to feel good about helping somebody else. And the NEFS Institute is an incubator project to initiate programs to provide support. That's, I'm working with some people to form something so that we actually initially, as our first project, working on helping out aid workers. One, to do pre-screening pre programs and orientation programs to orient the worker of all types of occupational hazards of being a relief worker, including the mental issues, including the mental health. Safety networks need to be established to, pro to protect the native relatives 
of expatriate workers. We need to find ways that it's not just the aid worker who's the victim. Very often the families are political tools in, this, in, in these crises. And there should be an exit interview process, some form of decompression interview for these aid workers so that they're provided with the resources and guidance to help themselves, not from that point onward, but for the rest of their lives. Thank you very much.